Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We know how this works. People will come drifting in over the next, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I have, uh, before I introduce our speaker for today, I do have a couple of announcements and both of the people, well, actually I actually have three announcements. Two of the people that are the, the subject of the announcements aren't even here yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway so the chip can get started. So first of all, let me just say that um, the uh, uh, University of Louisville Health Administration um, has uh, made and is granting everybody who has been here uh, working at U of L Hospital um, a certificate of appreciation for your years of service. So all of those boxes that you see out there that uh, Jason has, those are all certificates. That he's trying to catch everybody as they get in, but if you haven't picked up your certificate, you know, please do. Um, second, um, I would like to recognize two people who have helped me out because for those of you who don't realize it, this is my last Grand Rounds where I will be presiding over it. Uh, as of January 1st, Chris Kruger will be taking over um, as the interim chair of medicine. So she is the first person that I would like to acknowledge. Um, uh, Chris Kruger um, has become my right-hand person. Um, she has put into her job as the chief of clinical operations, um, all of the energy, um, attention to detail, um, and desire to improve our clinical service. She will, well, tell her to hurry up. <laughs> um, and so, yes, so she will be taking over um, as interim chair. Um, the last two years that I've been doing this really has been a real privilege for me. Um, and I thank everybody for uh, all of the help that they have given me and the support that they have given me uh, during this time. So at this point, and the woman of the hour walks in, you know, I would like to recognize her. Come on up, Chris. You know, when, when uh, Jesse uh, named me as the interim chair, you know, he gave me this ceremonial pen, <laughs> which I now hand to you. Power. power yeah, that's right. The power of the pen power there. The power of the pen. Sorry. That's okay. It wasn't a meeting. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I will say, though, that as you guys know, I'm an inveterate uh, Grand Rounds attender. And, you know, although I've done most of it at the VA because the VA Thursdays is a big day for me, you know, it's actually more fun for me to come down here. So I'll probably be coming down here for the remainder of the Grand Rounds. It's fun to see all my friends and buddies here. Uh, the second person that I want to recognize is Dr. Christian Furman. Um, Christian uh, took over as the Chief of General Internal Medicine um, uh, in July and really has brought all of her ingenuity, her energy, um, and uh, her organizational skills uh, to bear on the Division of General Internal Medicine, I think has really done a bang up job. I'm indebted to her uh, for all the time that and energy that she has put into this job. And, she is not here, but I have a certificate for her as well. Um, so with that, um, and I know I've taken up a lot of Chip's time, um, I'm going to introduce today's speaker who probably for this audience uh, needs no introduction. Um, Alfred Jacobs um, has been with the Division um, of Nephrology for a very long time. Um, he did his undergraduate work at Thomas More College and then came to the University of Louisville for medical school and basically ended up, that was 1978, and he's been here since then, having completed all of his training um, and joined the faculty. Um, he, in addition, has received his PhD from the Department of Pharmacology. He has distinguished himself um, as an expert in the field of dialysis which is what he's gonna talk about today. He has been the medical director of our dialysis program and has overseen the growth of the program to the point now where we have 400 dialysis patients. Uh, we have five of our own dialysis units. We have a robust home training program um, and an excellent inpatient um, acute dialysis training program as well. Uh, CHIP's research has been centered on uh, clinical uh, studies done uh, within the dialysis unit, 
These have been uh, sponsored both by uh, industry and has been co-investigator also um, on studies that have been sponsored by the NIH, you know, having to do with anemia management and iron studies in the dialysis unit. And so with no further ado, to give him the time that he needs to talk about the exciting topic of dialysis, where we have been and where we're going. Chip, you want to come up to the podium? Thank you, Alder. Um, let's see, when I started as a fellow, they parked me in the dialysis unit, which was then down on uh, Muhammad Ali for like four or five months. Um, so that's all I did was dialysis for all that entire period. Um, found it to be much more than a chronic illness. It was an amazing pathophysiology, and it just stuck with me. So I enjoy it greatly. Um, I have some disclosures. Um, I'm the medical director, as Ellen said, of a number of several of uh, our, our dialysis units. And I have a patent in conjunction with uh, Mike and Govinda, or Adam Govinda, um, regarding drug dosing to uh, automated measures. Um, I want to just try and convey uh, some of the evolution of dialysis and understanding of what the heck we're doing with dialysis. Uh, the impact of CKD on the, yes, on the healthcare system. A look at the uremic state uh, with uh, selected pathophysiologic stuff. There's so much, um, don't have time to talk about that in the time that we have. And then the directions for future ureme replacement. And for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on hemodialysis and I'll mention some of the other forms of of dialysis in past. Um, start off with a case. Um, um, this patient was a patient that was I, co I covered for many, many years. Um, she had autosomal processing kidney disease. She started dialysis at the age of 49 in 1980. Had a transient stay on peritoneal dialysis, was back by 1988. Um, her main thing, or in addition to renal failure, was that she had really bad rheumatoid arthritis, which eventually left her pretty much immobilized and in a wheelchair. But she stayed on dialysis because she was sharp as a tack. Uh, eventually, in part because of mobility issues, skin care issues, and stuff like that, um, she got to a nursing home and she developed skin wounds and family decided to take her off at 85. Um, she spent a total of 36 years on dialysis. So some people, how long, people who ask, how long can you live on dialysis? And this lady, for all her problems, lived a very long time. I'm a history buff, so you have to bear with me. Um, the organic compounds were recognized in the urine as early as the 1600s. Uh, in the late 1700s, uh, they began to try to sort it out. Um, uh, Forcourt and Backlund uh, named it ure, this compound that they were starting to evolve. It was, the composition was established in the early 1800s. And Wohler in 1847 synthesized urea. It was the first organic compound that was synthesized. He was crestfallen. Um, at the time, vitalism was abundant. They, people thought that there was something special about life that couldn't be constructed from organic methods, and sure enough, they did. Uh, according to him, the, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly act. Corcoran and Becklin also proposed that urea represented the end, of, the end product of nitrogenous metabolism, um, that the function of the kidney was to denitronize the body, um, urea was a source of ammonia, and that there's problems that arise if you don't get rid of urea. Um, there was a big fight about that. Uh, Richard Bright had described Wright's disease at the time, one of the earliest types of nephropathy. It had actual had atomic correlations to what was going on. Uh, a lot of what they were describing with uremia was more toxicolog toxicologic. And at the time, the measures, it was not very well uh, able to be measured. So for instance, it took a 50 ml sample of blood to be able to measure it to begin with. Uh, the methods were pretty erratic at the time, and so it was hard to make correlations with it. Eventually, however, um, uh, von Ferrix was able to nail things down and term the or introduce the term uremia, which he apparently misspelt. Um, so this is what we call it today. <coughs> Concurrently, um, a country practitioner in France or Switzerland uh, described uh, osmosis, um, movement of water across semipermeable membranes. And that inspired Thomas Graham, a Scottish chemist, a little bit later, um, to look at the separation of molecules to a semipermeable membrane, and it came up with the first term dialysis. Okay. Um, Abel, Roundtree, and Turner were 
science of pathophysiology in the early part of the century, uh, they performed the first dialysis in animals. Uh, they were starting with, uh, they were looking at drug compounds and they looked at, uh, so look at that, uh, salicy uh, salicylic acid and uh, were able to separate it out from the blood, but not in quantities that anywhere compared to what the kidney was doing, but that it might get better with further work. George Haas was a German physician. He served in World War I. Uh, trench nephritis was a huge morbidity for both sides back then. It was an unknown form of nephritis. A lot of people died, some people recovered, but it made an impression on Haas. And so in 1924, uh, he took, he was actually supposedly unaware of uh, those guys' work, and so he came up with his own form of dialysis. And so you can see the patient here. He's got blood lines coming through these big tubes. These were cellulose sausage casings. He's got his dialysis solutions, um, and eventually the blood returns back to the patient. Um, he dialyzed six patients. They all died. Um, in retrospect, it was fairly inefficient form of dialysis. And so he stopped at that point. This is a 1924 Mercedes-Benz Roadster. This is a pretty cool car, top of the line at the time. And Haas may have driven it around at the time. We'll, we'll see. William Kolf. Um, this guy is, is a giant in, in artificial organ stuff. And so we think about him all the time in, nephro well, in nephrology, or we think about him all the time, but, but he was massive in everything else. And so um, he came up with the first prototype dialyzer in 1943 during the war. He was part of the resistance. Um, basically, he built it out of spare parts and stuff and actually dialyzed 15 patients in a row. They all died uh, until the 16th, which finally survived. Um, by that time, he had a much better handle on things, and um, he gave his design away for free. Um, he moved to the United States shortly after the war. He collaborated with uh, Harvard to, or Brigham Hospital to, to update his kidney. Um, later moved on to Cleveland Clinic, and then later on to University of Utah, which had a big artificial program, uh, artificial organ program at the time. And if you remember the Jarvik 7, that was his stuff. Jarvik was his, his uh, project manager, whom he encouraged to give his name to the project to, as a motivation for it. His design was pretty simple. You had your sausage casing still. This time, much longer. He was wrapped around the tube, or wrapped around the cylinder. You rotated that through a bath. This is what it looked like. Again, pretty simple, like you might expect in the early part of the 19th century, 1900s. This is the Brigham kidney. Uh, which was around for a while. Then finally they start to make advances and things look, are becoming better, so to speak. His, his uh, sausage casings got replaced by big membranes. Uh, so you could, dial, you could sandwich layers of dialysate and blood for more efficient dialysis. Um, then you could compact that into smaller spaces by wrapping it around until we come to the hollow capillaries that we're kind of using today. And so for, now we have these uh, um, these are the current machines that are available in the United States. Uh, we use the one on the left, my left. Um, and these are actually, they don't look like a whole lot, but they're a world of difference from what he started off with. Uh, computerized, safety stuff. Um, imagine the blood leaks in his early rotating drum and stuff like that. All sorts of safety checks, all sorts of capabilities in terms of pressure control and everything. These are a big advance. This is the Tesla Roadster. Um, it's current, so nearly 100 years of development from, from the early Mercedes, this thing still looks like a car. It's got four wheels, drives on the road, even though it's got a lot of stuff under the hood. So in terms of a car, it's a huge advance, but whether it's the end point for transportation is an entirely different question. These are our current dialyzers. The, his giant little thing we've got condensed down to these little foot long, uh, foot long dialyzers. The membrane technology is entirely different from what he used, much more biocompatible. So, a nice advance also. This, these were primarily used for patients with acute renal failure. Um, but the problem is, is that um, some patients, some patients didn't recover function, or people. 
uh, developing renal failure, or people developed renal failure from chronic disease, so that kind of knew it was coming, it wasn't acute. Uh, so you have increasing pressure for expanded dialysis usage. Um, there were some federal grants for kidney disease programs to set up dialysis units in some of the hospitals, and we had one back in the day, so our unit is probably one of the oldest. Um, they had what they called Aronoff, what, his, what he talks here was called death squads, where a group of people would sit and say, well, yeah, this 25-year-old person with this disease can do dialysis, but this 60-year-old person with diabetes is, eh, we're not going to do that. Um, however, in 1972, Medicare covered hemodialysis, and it pretty much became available uh, hemodialysis for all. Okay, so we got to this point where now dialysis is available, but, but what are you doing with it? What, what's your goals? How do you know what you're doing is correct? And so, not until about 1981, where they put together the National Cooperative Dialysis File. And this was a fairly simple two-by-two -two design. What's important, the time on dialysis or the urea concentration? Because that was the main marker of urea that they had, or we still have at the time. Um, so it was, how do you get, how do you adjust the BUN? You, you, change, you can change the blood flow rate for the dialyzer, you can change the dialysis flow rate, smaller dialyzers, bigger dialyzers, the direction of flow, we usually use counter current flow through our dialyzers, but they had to achieve uh, certain targets and they were shooting for around a B out of 120 in some groups and 70 in others. They had pretty close to that. Um, the high urea groups were around, you know, over the hundreds and the low urea groups were in the 70s. Um, and they achieved their times of, you know, four and a half hours versus about three hours and 20 minutes or so. There was a big difference. So the people with the lower ureas are, tended to do better than ones who didn't in terms of being able to remain on dialysis. And they also did a little bit better in terms of being able to avoid hospitalization. Okay. Well, that's nice. Um, but we have math people that just can't leave things alone. So uh, Sergeant Gotch kind of looked at this from an analytical standpoint and treated it more like a, kind of like a drug. So um, you have a urea concentration, you do a, do something, uh, you have this clearance. And so they developed a concept of what we call k tier V. This is just, well, let me just grab this a little bit. These are the, pop these are the population. Um, the white ones were the ones who didn't do as well. The ones in the black did okay. Uh, the urea concentration here, and they also looked at protein catabolic rates, uh, just to make sure that you don't have, you know, a low urea from poor catabolic or protein catabolic rate. And so in general, um, most of the ones who did well were clustered down here. And if you look at the, they expressed the clearance as KTRV, which means, you know, the clearance of the dialyzer times the time. So it's a volume unit divided by the patient's body of water. So they're saying um, to get the best dialysis, we actually use 1.2. That's 1.2 times their body, or 1.2 times their body water is being cleaned of urea. And so that's our target still to this day. Okay. Um, of course, there has to be mixed some mass still, and so part of more than just a urea thing, there's also a hemofiltration component if you're taking volume off a patient. And we use a, a, a rated subject or look related thing for looking at uh, mostly home programs where you're trying to look at their dialysis quality over a week instead of a single treatment like we do for individual hemodialysis. Okay. So just to give you a couple of important things in terms of the medical part of it, or the public policy part of it. So in 1972, it became available, or dialysis became available to everybody. Um, the very subsequent laws created a, um, a comprehensive uh, methodology for collecting data so they can keep track of this huge amount of money they're going to wind up spending on all this stuff. Um, they reported public out, they reported outcomes and say you can go to dialysis.org and type in your zip code and see what your local dialysis units are doing in terms of what they think is their quality measures. And some of those are good and some of them I argue with. Um, and they have a, a very successful uh, quality improvement program. And so you have these quality measures and if you don't meet these, um, you get dinged commercial, or you get dinged for your reimbursement. The facilities get dinged for the reimbursement. So that's one of the, that's been kind of in the forefront, even though that's kind of going for a lot of things nowadays. Uh, we've been doing this for a while. 
Um, one thing that was kind of good and kind of bad is that they bundled the composite rate. So all the stuff for dialysis goes into one payment. So your dialysis treatment and whatever, the tubing, the dialyzers, the nowadays the drugs and stuff all go into that same, same bundle and that's what you get paid, period. So it's good, it's all covered for patients, that helps with that. But if you came up with a really radical dialyzer that did an incredible job of uh, addressing things that cost five times more, um, it's not gonna get paid for. You're gonna get paid the same and so there's no incentive for technology, new technology to be coming into the dialysis unit. So where we are now, so this is a uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, so since we're in the Department of Medicine, all of us are gonna be seeing, you know, 14% or so of our patients are gonna have some form of chronic kidney disease, uh, mostly stage three, um, uh, but also stage four and five, which, which impacts heavily on, on folks going to dialysis. Um, the expenditures are pretty high for CKD, almost 20% for a relatively small population of patients with that. Um, this is the incidence rate, uh, new patients come to dialysis, and after a significant climb, it may be starting to peak out a little bit. Um, this is the transplant numbers and people in peritoneal dialysis, so. We've done better with survival with our patients, and so this is the prevalent patients, our old patients. Um, so they're still perked along the, the patient population continues to rise, and so this is gonna be a huge expenditure for a while. Um, this is the characteristics of people that are starting. I just wanna show this as an example. So for sex, race, whatever, it's all right around 10 mLs per minute of GFR when they start, although that's pretty soft. Uh, as long as they're doing well, we don't always push them to do dialysis just because they reach a certain number. And this is a advertisement. So Back on the earlier slide, I forgot to point it out, is a number of years ago, they came up with fistula first uh, program to try to get people with uh, native AD fistulas, which I'm not gonna talk about other than this thing, but still nearly 10 years or so afterwards, two thirds of our patients still start dialysis with just a cap. Um, let's get back. As I mentioned, survival has improved for uh, dialysis patients, so we are doing some things right. Okay. So just wanna talk a little bit about the uremic state. Um, when a patient comes in, they're typically on a three-day week schedule. They'll get their dialysis on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Um, before the NCDS study, we kind of looked at the uh, concentration of urea from the first day to the second day and had this time average concentration that some people thought was a, mark, a potential marker. And so a lot of people were kind of shoot for around 70 anyway with that. And this is kind of what's behind the scenes with that. Um, so people dialyze for Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they get a huge clearance. You can get 350 mLs of urea removal per minute, uh, which is a huge amount. This is scaled. And so if you have a GFR uh, of 100, this is about where you're gonna be running. If you were to look at the area of the curve under this, you get a lot more doubt. You get a lot more urea clearance than you do in these little rectangles here. If you have a GFR of around 10, and I know you're, you're maybe even a little below what you're able to get with dialysis. But the part of the point is your urea clearance with dialysis is tiny compared to what, we're do, what your own native kidney can do. So you're, in fact, it's about uh, a tenth or so. So it's not like we're you know, giving you normal GFR with, with all this. If you look at this over the over appropriate time frames, it's relatively small. Now, dialysis, um, it's, as we mentioned, separation of particles across membranes, the semi membranes, we're dealing with aqueous dilutions. And so if you're dealing with small molecules, uh, they come across fairly easy with dialysis. And so we can get rid of a lot of stuff. Excellent. GFR or clearances in the hundreds uh, per minute while they're on, on treatment. There are some middle molecules, however, um, of various types. And some of these come across our, with our current membranes. They're much bigger than the old cellulosic membranes. We can get some of these off to some extent. Uh, but not great. And then there's gonna be a lot of solutes that are relatively low molecular weight, but they're uh, protein bound. They're not particularly um, uh, aqueous. Uh, and we're finding out that some of these are 
fairly prominent in the Eurydian state in terms of pathophysiology. And we're not removing these very well at all. Um, their levels in the blood are orders of magnitude greater than what they are in the normal person. Some of these are listed here. This is a list put out by Eurotox, a consortium that looks at this kind of stuff. Uh, they grade graded on a four, three, two, one scale. Um, these are thought to be the more severe. This is supposed to be the worst. Um, some of these we, we're they're blaming on the GI tract as, as uh, being an origin for that. Um, but a lot of compounds that are supposed to be have a significant problems that again we just don't remove very well by and large. Even urea, which we largely considered relatively innocuous. We've talked about, we've seen reports of people dialyzing people with uh, having urea in the bath, so we didn't take it off. Um, and they did reasonably well for a while, but it's been found to cause uh, carbamylation of proteins, for instance, which can lead to uh, advanced arthrosclerosis. And there's some data that may show involved with cardiomyopathy and protein wasting. So, um, um, yeah, problems with that. Cardiac, there's a lot of literature coming out now on uh, uremia and heart issues. Um, it can, the uremic state can affect it in a number of ways. Um, as we've talked about, uremic toxins having a direct impact on both heart and, ves and vessels, as well as uh, uh, some of the mineral disorders creating cardiac calcifications. If, they ever, if you ever looked at some of the calcific scores in dialysis patients, they tend to be in the thousands oftentimes, uh, way out of range. Um, left ventricular hypertrophy is um, commonplace uh, among dialysis patients. I'll show you a little bit more data on that. When we're doing dialysis, you have non-physiologic uh, fluid removal. I showed you those bars where we're doing all that kind of stuff in four hours, uh, so a total of 12 hours of 168 hours in a week. Um, so I have patients that gain eight kilograms in between their dialysis treatments. And so before their dialysis, they're eight kilograms and we suck it all off in a relatively short period of time and, and that can create some issues. Um, Some interesting stuff. Um, so I'm not a cardiologist, so don't get on my case. Uh, this is a PET scan from a patient undergoing hemodialysis. And he starts off okay, and then over the course of his dialysis, uh, his myocardial perfusion gets to what the investigators were worried were critically low levels, although the patient looked like he was okay. And this was considered myocardial stunning, and patients like this would go through repeated process disease called dialysis. So we have these repeated bouts of cardiac ischemia, which they believe would lead to cardiomyopathy down the line. This is, a, that, that was one patient. This is a compilation of several other patients. And again, uh, with PET scanning, their myocardial perfusion for um, several of the patients they selected anyway, I guess we have to be selective in trying to get people into PET scanner while they're doing dialysis, um, but dropped in all these to some extent. So hemodynamic changes with particularly cardiac, complicate, cardiac implications are going on frequently with our dialysis patients. Um, they also had the chronic renal insufficiency cohort study where they looked at echocardiograms uh, for people over uh, pre and post dialysis and found that um, they had progressive uh, decline in left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, uh, they were yeah, things worsened than they were considered significant risk for post dialysis mortality. And authors were thought that this might be an opportunity for intervention and hopefully amelioration. This is the monitoring and dialysis study. And they took 60 some odd patients and looked, they were somehow able to get them to agree to having um, implanted uh, monitors placed. And so they looked at how they did over the course of the day. And let's see, I think this is all significant uh, events here, and you can see that on their Monday, Wednesday, Friday type schedule, that they tend to, generally they tend to peak around the, just before, during, or after their dialysis treatment. So I think this is atrial fibrillation, I believe, this is bradycardia, and this is all things. And so again, for atrial fibrillation on dialysis days, it tends to be a problem, um, and heading in, even into the next just before the, on sometimes the day before the dialysis treatment. So, so arrhythmias with dialysis and these fluid shifts is a problem. Um, this is a European study. 
I think they had 600 some odd people. They were using, blanking on the name of it, the methodology to look at body water. Um, usually we, we have, we prescribe a dry weight, which is our best guess of what the patient should be based upon our clinical exams and stuff. As long as their lungs are clear, they don't have edema, their blood pressure is too deep or decent, we think they're doing okay. Um, in the first part, they just looked at blood pressure and found that um, their a blood pressure for dialysis patients were of around 150 um, at the beginning and cumulative uh, gave the best dog ratio. Um, so our patients seemed to do a little bit better with some degree of hypertension. Um, early on, uh, having a low blood pressure is worse than having a high blood pressure, but it eventually catches up to them eventually. And then if you throw excess volume on top of that, it makes things even worse. So, um, and sometimes uh, almost doubling their uh, risk ratios for mortality um, if they're volume overloaded, whether they're, uh, um, um, you know, blood pressure is high or low. That's all the stuff I'm going to talk about heart. So we're going to jump the brain here a little bit. Um, people have been looking at uh, cognitive impairment in dialysis patients, and so they do various types of, the neurologists do various types of skills, assessments, or uh, discussions while they're on dialysis, and it appears that hemodialysis patients tend to do uh, worse compared to peritoneal dialysis patients. And my S risk, um, that's apples and oranges. Um, uh, peritoneal dialysis patients are, are, since they're doing stuff at home, they have to go through a training process, they have to be capable of doing a somewhat complex te technique. And so if you, if you fail doing that, then you get dumped back into the hemodialysis pool, and so you're, you're a little bit selective with that. Uh, up to two-thirds of patients have some form of uh, cognitive impairment on dialysis, including during dialysis. There's been some stuff with uh, low cerebral oxygen during dialysis, which I'll show you. Um, and it's thought that these low oxygen saturations may be contributing to intradialytic declines and long-term declines in cognitive function. Um, this is um, cerebral blood flow um, has its own autoregulation. And classically, somewhere as long as the, map, the mean arterial pressure is between 60 to 150, the brain can do what it needs to do to regulate flow through there. But it turns out in dialysis patients that that may not be the case. Um, in this study, and this is a population study, so, and they comment, both this study and the next study commented that you have to be careful because population studies may not reflect, when you, when you look at individual patients, the severity of changes and stuff. Um, but they found out that uh, dialysis patients tended to lose their autoregulation with a map of 74. And even then, um, there was a wide range so that patients, uh, 70% of patients, 70% of ischemic events occurred um, with a mean arterial pressure of greater than 60. This is a, a second study. It's a, again with a pop with a, uh, showing a decrease in cerebral oxygen flow. Um, and on looking correlates, they found it was associated with uremic, with a fluid removal uh, and the ultrafiltration rate. Um, and there was some association with change in weight, which would again tie into ultrafiltration, how much fluid we're taking off. Okay. Um, and just as a side comment, I should have mentioned earlier, um, ultrafiltration rate, how much fluid we're taking off, has become one of the quality improvement project uh, indicators. Or it's moving up in the in the level. It's in the demonstration phase or in the the reporting phase right now. But that's going to become a in the next year or two. That should be one of our reimbursement issues. So if we take off more than about 13 ml per kilogram per hour, uh, that's considered bad and we'll, we'll be deemed for that. So I can just convince my eight kilogram guy of that. This is from the same study. Uh, this is shows an uh, uh, increase in white matter intensities, whatever that means, uh, over the course of a year period, um, raising concerns of long-term uh, problems from these, presumably from these episodes of recurrent hypoxia. Slides out of range. Oh, so I'll skip that. Okay. Um, you can say what you want about Trump. But on the kidney side, um, he saw an initiative that, that is helping to breathe some attention uh, into some kidney issues, as well as some funding. So they're announcing, they're, they're, they're pushing the uh, American Kidney Health Initiative. 
um, in part because you have 37 million people suffering from chronic kidney disease. Um, actually, we probably have closer to 800,000 end-stage patients by now. Um, we have 100,000 or so people waiting on the list to get a kidney. Uh, ninth leading cause of death. Um, significantly high mortality rate, and, and it's expensive. So they want to do something about that. So they want to decrease uh, patients reaching end-stage renal disease by 25% by 2030. Um, that will be a challenge. Uh, they want to have 80% of people of new end-stage patients in 2025 receiving dialysis at home or a transplant. So that's a hundred and that's eighty thousand people. Uh, hope we're going to be at home on dialysis. Okay, and then doubling the number of kidneys uh, available for transplant by twenty thirty. These are kidney transplants now. So currently we're doing I don't know about twenty thousand or so transplants right now. So that's going to be a huge jump in being able to triple these numbers. Um, to meet some of the goals they're describing. And currently, um, in my opinion, um, there's been a dearth of new technology uh, pushed into the kidney area for a long time. And the Health and Human Services Agency with the National American Society of Nephrology have put together the Kidney Innovation Accelerator Program uh, to try and change that. Um, you know, it costs something like $80,000 a year for a dialysis patient or some of the new cancer drugs. It's $500,000. The Part C thing is like $3 million. So we could use a little attention. This is our current home dialysis stuff. And so this is our next stage machine. If you round up the VA and the ICUs, this is the same machine we use for continuous therapies out there. Um, it used to, when it initially came out, there were bags of fluid that you hung up here. Um, but that's been replaced by this little unit that generates dialysis water into a little bag underneath here, and so that's taken out during the dialysis process. Um, it comes in 50 and 60 liters, and so um, you can do up to two dialysis treatments with that, and then you have to change the bags and stuff. And so it's nice that you can do this at home. I don't know how many people actually do it in their living room. Um, but um, it requires some work on your part. You have to be uh, cognitively uh, controlled enough to be able to run this machine, uh, answer the alarms and stuff like that. You have to change out the set, uh, the plastic set in here, the tubing set um, that has a dialyzer and stuff like that. This bag uh, needs to be changed out instead of any other treatment. And there's a little carbon water processing unit under there about every month or so. So it's not without some intensity on the patient doing it at home. This is the AMIA peritoneal dialysis uh, machine. Uh, this is the current, uh, this is the most current device from Baxter right now. Um, uh, you know, we do set it up so that people have a little machine by their bedside. They, they can do their dialysis at nighttime. Uh, when they start off, they tend to roll in the lines and the alarms wake them up. But overall, uh, most people find it a fairly comfortable experience. They do most of their dialysis at nighttime with it so they can disconnect and go about their business in the morning. While they're sleeping, you'll get four or five exchanges. Uh, depending on the quality of your peritoneal membrane, sometimes we'll have to do a daytime exchange or so, but it does a nice job. And the good thing is that nowadays, both these things are electronically connected, so we can actually tell if the patient's actually doing them or not, which is a big deal. Some of you may have heard about Dean Common uh, getting together with CVS, and they're going to do dialysis at home. They're going to have a, a pharmacy provider doing dialysis, and this is his machine, the Hemocare, um, and it's I don't like the regular dialysis machine. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't announced too many details of what's inside the machine. They just recruited their first patient for clinical trials in August. And so they're still accumulating that. And hopefully when they reuse that, we'll have more data about this. I understand it's got uh, online uh, water processing. And so you don't have to worry about bags and stuff like that. You just come in the machine and you got your water. And supposedly uh, most of the lines and stuff are reusable and stuff. So you don't have to be changing them every time. So that makes uh, takes a lot of the workload off of the patient. This is the automated wearable artificial kidney. Uh, this is out of actually mostly out of Indonesia, I think. It's in clinical trials there in Japan. That's a wearable PD machine. And so you have your PD catheter um, and it's attached to this machine. And the bags of fluid that we use to, to you know, push 
pushing the potassium in and drain it out, push it in and drain it out. Or now you just start off with the same volume, but you're using sorbent cartridges uh, to basically clean the PD fluid so, so you don't need the best volumes. In fact, you only have about a, a, a little over a liter, I believe, is the, their, the volumes they're using. So in clinical trials now, and we'll see how this works out, uh, initial reports are fairly positive from what they've done so far. This is uh, Victor Jura's uh, wearable artificial kidney uh, out of uh, USC. Um, it's a mess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So the patients, most of the patients who trial this, they've only done like 18 patients, but most of the patients liked it because they can get up and wander around and things. Um, they didn't let them kind of walk around the city, except for last, I think the last couple patients, they let go outside and stuff like that. They kept pretty, because it's a, it's a trial, the FDA didn't let them do that much stuff. Um, but like I said, she was able to get out and do some things. Uh, supposedly, they've miniaturized things. Um, so they have the same type of sorbent cleaning cartridges and stuff like they do in the PD stuff. But but they've gone silent on this. They're, they've got their own company, and so we have no idea what it looks like. When he talks at meetings, they say hardly anything, so they're annoying to go to. Um, but hopefully that's going to develop to where that'll be good. One of the compl big complaints that patients have is that this messes up, dialysis messes up their lives. They're tied to dialysis. It's hard to keep a job when you're going four hours during the work week uh, to a place. And so some patients have expressed things, oh, I'd just like to go and sit down a box on my desk and do my computer work, computer, or work on my computer at work. So. Um, yes, yeah, so it would be nice to make this patient convenient. Um, Bill Thistle, uh, who's out of Vanderbilt, um, is working on the bioartificial kidney in conjunction with USC. Uh, they've got a little silicon uh, membrane that they claim is the same uh, ultrapatient capacity as the uh, dialysis I showed you before. Um, this is the Vanderbilt version, and this is the USC version. Um, so basically, you have this little filter that, uh, along with a bio, what they call a bioreactor. So these are proximal tubular cells, or yeah, tubular cells, in this bioreactor part that uh, acts like the kidney in terms of you know taking out the desired stuff and helping put out the bad stuff. Uh, you drain into the bladder, so it's completely implantable or completely under the skin and not seen. Um, I like his version much better than this pack of cigarettes or whatever there. Um, and they got a Kidney X uh, award for pursuing this um, in 2019. So hopefully we'll see some progress in these lines. There are other ways of uh, trying to come up with a bioartificial kidney. Um, oh, let me back up. This is not new, by the way. So about 10 years or so ago, there was a device that they were testing in the critical care community where they had, again, tubular cells and a second dialyzer um, and actually had some positive response to that, but it was uh, impractical for the time, uh, but the technology has been carried forward. So there's, um, we do realize we need a scaffold of some type to, to contain uh, the nephron components, whether that could be a decellularized kidney from some, some source or a bioprinted thing. Uh, take uh, stem cells and populate that, incubate that in, a, in an organ assembly unit, um, and come up with a kidney that can be implanted, and maybe even your own kidney from your own stem cell. And actually, Dean Thomas got his finger in this. He has his own bioreactors for growing organic tissues and stuff. This is a, a recent article. Um, generation of functioning nephrons uh, from human pluripotent stem cells. Uh, they had a huge paper. It's all about stem cell stuff, and they talk about all sorts of weird things I don't know anything about. So, um, but the important thing is they came up with a functioning glomerulus uh, and a functioning tubules attached to this. Um, so basically, a little kidney organoids that they were um, uh, see, or that were somewhere uh, could use stem cells to for kidney repair and as tools to investigate human genetic diseases. So perhaps in a few years, this can be advanced to uh, become a more biocompatible kidney replacement option. Thank you. Yes, that was great. Mm -hmm. So, um, I didn't hear
Louisville General mm -hmm. at the old Louisville Center. Never had the opportunity to older than you, older than Tim. <laughs> I was there. You were well. You were there too, but I mean, the, like Sydney Markham. You know, they talked about. Hours before they would start work, just to pick up the dials. I hear a lot about the fact that you know, so, uh, so, so, Chip. Realistically speaking, that's the production's coming down. Um, I think the the wearable peritoneal dialysis gene is already in clinical trials. It's uh, relatively simple, um, and so I think I could see that in the next several years. The problem with the they might. They could probably use some of the the dialysis technology part uh, of the implantable kidney for a wearable dialysis machine as a much smaller component than what they have now. But there's huge problems with if you have a bioreactor, for instance, how do you keep these tubular cells living inside this little object? They tend not to do that for very long. How do you replace it if they go bad? There's still unanswered questions of um, thrombosis and stuff like that and these things and how you're going to if you put something in there and then a thrombosis like a lot of our dialysis stuff does um, then you're a major operation to do that so I think that's a long way away but in terms of coming up with a machine that a patient can take to work park on their desk and continue their stuff I, I can see that probably coming in about five to ten years Um, well, we're not. Um, and they're, right now, they're, this is still, most of these articles about the cognitive stuff has just, just been in the last couple of years. Uh, so it's not a widespread thing. I think that the data is interesting and concerning enough that I'm expecting a lot more attention to be paid for it going forward. Yeah. yeah I think part of the problem, though, is, is that as long as we're confined to dialysis that's only done on an intermittent basis, that's going to be an ongoing problem. Right. Thank you. No. patients, you know, in the United States. So I called you out at the beginning. Okay, Chris, 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 Chris. And you too, Chris. Oh, oh. Yes, I'll put my coat on. I feel so cold. Yeah. Christian holds the. Mark, don't forget to take your.
Yes, I do. All right, you all have a good day. Yep. Okay. I don't think we're okay. Yes, yes, we will. Oh, well, you know, I mean, today's not going to be a day. I mean, you know, day in the morning, I got clinic in the afternoon. I'm saving veterans from dialysis. Yeah, I'm going to get that done. I'm saving veterans from dialysis. Take your time, man. That was interesting. Thing. All right, you didn't take coffee this time. <laughs> That's your water. Yeah, you can take that. Well, you can, so, you can uh, take uh, that. Uh, oh, it's just a remind. That's just a personal <laughs> reminder. <laughs> Why? Janice has been just been yelling at me. So, what would you say? I, I, I don't walk over to my car. So, I just turn back towards the team. I'm not heading over towards the north. Yeah, I'm, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Dr. Jacobs, sorry. You need to get your you need to get your uh, your drive. Forgot about that. Do what now? Do what now? Oh, I got it back from uh, Cindy. Took care of. Took care. Well, no, no, it's just, it's just, you know, just a nice way to say but
Yeah. I think we'll be okay. Uh, they they may have an, they may have a plan for what they want to do with them. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sherry, Sherry. Yeah, Sherry and them, I think, may have an idea what they want to do with them. So, thank you, though. I appreciate it.